It was a case unlike most others. Forensic evidence proved the perpetrator broke out of the crime scene rather than breaking in. No one knew why until some evidence on the victim's hands provided the answer. often face hard choices. Many find it difficult to live alone or grow tired of maintaining their own home. But 82-year-old Catherine Bishop wasn't one of them. She was a quiet person, but she was feisty. She trusted everybody, and she was my mother. Catherine's home was in Hummelstown, Pennsylvania, just outside the state capital of Harrisburg. One morning, a city employee saw Catherine's side door had been broken into and called police. The ambulance was in the driveway, and I kept saying, where's my mother, where's my mother? And, and a man appeared, and he said, you I'm sorry, he said, your mother's dead. And I just went limp. Catherine Bishop had been beaten to death. The scene was a violent scene. The victim had been beaten severely. Uh, there were, was a pool of blood around her head uh, that she had literally bled out. I believe there are defense wounds on, on the arms that were observed. We had a, a broken fingernail also. So there are signs there that she she probably did try to fight off her attacker or attackers. There was a half-finished crossword puzzle in the living room, and in Catherine's hand, a broken pen. It appeared she was awake when the break-in occurred. When you get to be that age, you have to expect death to happen, but not the way my mother died. And that's, that's what really, really bothers me. Strangest of all, there appeared to be nothing missing. According to the family, everything appeared normal as it was, that there was no ransacking through the house, that there was no signs that they were looking for anything in particular. Through body temperature and the degree of rigor mortis, the medical examiner estimated that Catherine had been killed the night before. The death occurred between 9 and 10.30 in the evening. At first, the side door looked like the point of entry, but the broken glass was outside, not inside. Very unusual. Majority of the time I've seen break-ins, the glass is always into the inside of the house because people are breaking in, not breaking out. Police canvassed the neighborhood for leads. Anytime you have an investigation where you have no witnesses and you have no evidence, uh, there is a strong likelihood that the case will never be solved. One of the neighbors said she was walking her dog the night before around 10.30 and heard some kind of noise. She turned around. She saw a shadowy figure running from a Mrs. Bishop's home. She was only able to see this figure uh, for a very brief time period, maybe uh, 10, 15 seconds. And that, along with the medical evidence, was able to, allowed us to establish the time of the crime. If this was the killer, he left through the side door, which explains why the glass was outside. If so, how did he enter the house? And what was his motive? It was a crime that caused a lot of community concern and, of course, doubled uh, our motivation to find who was responsible. Because of the nature of the crime, 
Investigators were certain that Catherine Bishop's autopsy would reveal evidence to help their case. The medical examiner concluded that Catherine was hit over 60 times. The cause of death wasn't difficult to determine. It was the breaking of the ribs on both sides uh, of the body bilaterally, uh, uh, preventing her from expanding and contracting her chest and she died of suffocation. As a matter of routine, the medical examiner used clear tape to pick up any potential trace evidence on Catherine's body and clothing. And this technique identified something potentially valuable. It was a fiber, and it was a fiber that wasn't consistent with what she was wearing, but where she picked it up from, that we can't say. Also on the tape lift from Catherine's hand was a small chip of white paint. Forensic analyst John Evans noticed that the paint chip contained several layers, each a different color. He then compared it to paint samples from the exterior of Catherine's home, and it matched only one area, the paint around her basement window. We looked at the layer structures and the colors of the layers that were present. In the paint chip from the basement window, it contained three layers, a top white layer, a middle yellow layer, and a bottom tannish layer. The window was located about four and a half feet above ground level. And on the exterior of the home on the siding, there were black marks. It appeared that someone had actually crawled up the siding and used the siding to help them go through the window. Police found marks on the top of the washing machine that looked like fabric impressions. The impression had the striated lines. It had the appearance of a pair of denim jeans, what it would look like. Technicians dusted the area and found some partial finger and palm prints, but they were too badly smudged to be useful. In their search for suspects, investigators made a list of everyone who had been in Catherine's home over the past several weeks. We found utility bills on the kitchen table, which indicated that she had a fuel oil delivery. The oil company indicated they delivered oil three days before Catherine's murder. Our investigators went out, contacted each of these people. Uh, we found out that the fuel oil man uh, did not even come in the home. And the oil delivery men had solid alibis for the night of the murder. Police also found a receipt for a chimney cleaning service. Two men cleaned Catherine's chimney on the afternoon of her murder. Catherine's daughter visited her mother that day and spoke with the two chimney cleaners. It was 300 and some dollars, and I remember saying, to have your chimney cleaned, it's that much? The two men were identified as 27-year-old Tim McEnany and his cousin, 20-year-old Andrew Reichman. McEnany was apparently part of this guild of chimney sweeps. It's my understanding that it was Tim McEnany that was the, the boss of the company. McEnany and Reichman told police they finished at Catherine's house around 6.30, then went to a nearby bar where they stayed until after 1 o'clock in the morning. Several bar patrons confirmed their alibi. Then Catherine's daughter remembered something. When she was in her mother's home on the afternoon of her murder, she saw three rolls of cash in a basket on the dining room table, money Catherine used when shopping for groceries. And I remember saying, Mother, put that money away. You shouldn't have that out with strangers in the house. I really felt uncomfortable because of that with them in the house, and there she had this money. When police searched Catherine's home, they found the basket, but not the three rolls of cash. I think it was Mrs. Bishop's daughter was saying it was about $6,000 cash, I think. Then a confidential source told journalist Pete Shellam that Tim McEnany and Andrew Reichman made a little side trip in the early morning hours after the murder. The robbery occurred around 10 p.m. Sources have told me that Tim and his cousin went to Atlantic City. Which is where the casinos are, a 
perfect place to spend $6,000. The medical examiner estimated that Catherine Bishop was murdered sometime between 9 and 10.30 p.m. The only people who were in Catherine's home that day, besides her daughter, were two chimney sweepers who said they left around 6.30 and went to a nearby bar. Both bartenders were attractive young women. The chimney servicemen were engaging in small talk and uh, commenting to these bartenders all the time they were there and having beers. The men claimed they were in the bar all night until closing time, but the bartenders disputed that. The first bartender actually sat next to one of the chairs that the chimney sweeps sat in uh, when she was done her shift. And when we interviewed the second bartender, they were in an, an entirely different location at the bar, two different chairs later on. Catherine's home was only a few miles away from the bar. A 30-minute window would have been sufficient to have left the bar, committed the crime, and to have returned. So with a warrant, police searched the chimney cleaners' homes and confiscated the clothes they were seen wearing that night at the bar. The Pennsylvania State Police forensic team concluded that the fibers from McEnany's black T-shirt were identical to the one found on Catherine's body. But Tim McEnany's lawyers were convinced that was a mistake, so they hired their own trace evidence expert, Skip Palahniuk. Skip Palahniuk is highly respected in many quarters. And so it was obviously of great concern when he's going to be testifying uh, for the defense. Palahniuk first examined the fibers from McEnany's T-shirt under a microscope. Well, first of all, there appeared to be both synthetic black fibers um, and, and natural black fibers. Next. Palahniuk compared the fibers from McEnany's T-shirt to those taken from Catherine Bishop's body. And then just basically joining them up with a line between them. You can see, are the diameters the same? Are the colors really the same? Tim McEnany and his lawyers hoped that Skip Palahniuk would disagree with the state police forensics expert. But he didn't. We found in this case, though, when we compared the cotton fibers and the tape of the cotton fibers from the shirt, everything looked the same. When we compared the polyester fibers from the tapes with the polyester fibers from the shirt, again, everything looked the same. We could not see any differences. This was hardly the conclusion Tim McEnany and his lawyers wanted. The defense attorney gets satisfaction from seeing his client, who he believes to be innocent, found innocent, our role is entirely different than theirs. Our role is to be objective seekers of scientific truth, and that's what we do. There is a certain irony in the fact that they're uh, spending a great deal of money trying to get the, the big hitter to come in. When you've got someone of that stature, they're going to concede what they must concede. But McEnany insisted the fibers proved nothing. He said he was working inside Catherine's home on the afternoon of her murder, so naturally he would have shed some shirt fibers along the way. So the state's forensic analyst, John Evans, examined the rest of McEnany's clothing and found another tantalizing clue. I was given the jacket to examine for trace evidence. On inspection of the inside pockets, I discovered on the left-hand side a paint chip that looked like it could have come from a house. Evans discovered that the paint chip contained three separate layers of paint, white on top, yellow in the middle, and tan on the bottom. With a scalpel, Evans separated the layers and subjected each to infrared light. Different paint reacts to the infrared light in different ways, revealing its chemical makeup and paint consists of many chemical compounds. We found that the top layers of all three samples were consistent with each other in the infrared region. Evans then tested the bottom layer of the tan paint of the samples, and they too had the same chemical makeup. The state police took samples from all over that house, and the other samples didn't match. It was the sample from the basement window, the point of entry, that matched the chip found in the defendant's pocket 
and Mrs. Bishop's hand. The paint and fiber on Catherine's body clearly linked Tim McEnany to the murder. But there was no forensic evidence linking Andrew Reichman. The theory was that uh, Reichman bargained to be part of a burglary, but not part of a murder. And when he saw what McEnany was doing to Mrs. Bishop, it was then that he, uh, he hightailed it out of there. Unfortunately, the neighbor walking her dog couldn't identify Reichman as the man running from the scene. So only Tim McEnany was charged with Catherine Bishop's murder. To cement the case, investigators decided to check one last thing. Tim McEnany's cell phone calls on the night of the murder. And the information in those records explained everything. As prosecutors prepared their murder case against Tim McEnany, they had the paint and fiber evidence, but wanted to make sure they had enough to convict him. So investigators subpoenaed McEnany's cell phone records for the night of Catherine's murder. We took the phone into the lab, and we sequenced the phone to last number called, whatever that would be. And it turned out to be uh, Mrs. Bishop's phone number. McEnany's phone record showed he made two calls to Catherine Bishop's home that night, one at 10.07 PM, and the second call a minute later. The calls were short in duration, 20 seconds, 10 seconds. Uh, there appeared to be no, no connection with the home phone, and the calls were made from Mr. McEnany's cell phone. But if Catherine was home, why didn't she pick up the phone? She was hard of hearing. I would call her, and it would ring. It Sometimes it rang as high as 15, 20 times, and she never answered. Prosecutors believe McEnany saw the rolls of cash on Catherine's dining room table while he and Reichman were cleaning her chimney. Later at the bar, he probably made the decision to steal it. McEnany called Catherine's home shortly after 10 p.m., and again a minute later. When there was no answer, he assumed Catherine was either asleep or out. The evidence shows that McEnany entered Catherine's home through the basement window and inadvertently collected the tiny chips of paint. Once inside, McEnany discovered that Catherine was awake and made a split-second decision to kill her. Catherine fought back, grabbing the shirt fibers as well as the paint chip. McEnany kicked her over 60 times. Prosecutors believe McEnany's accomplice ran from Catherine's home, breaking the back door window. But the neighbor couldn't identify if it was Reichman because she never saw his face. Later, McEnany and Reichman returned to the bar to establish an alibi. According to an informant, McEnany and Reichman then drove to an Atlantic City casino to gamble, presumably with Catherine's money, but this was never corroborated. During the police interrogation, McEnany refused to identify Reichman as his accomplice, but virtually confessed to the crime. And without any solicitation, he said, it's that effing beer. Every time I drink, I get in trouble. Tim McEnany was tried and convicted of second degree murder, robbery, and conspiracy. But before he was sentenced, McEnany ran towards the window and tried to jump out. A assistant public defender and the sheriff were able to grab him and, and pull him back in. And at that point, his family, who were in the courtroom, were screaming and yelling. The defendant was screaming, you've convicted an innocent man. It was, it was bedlam. McEnany stayed long enough to hear his sentence, life in prison, and was taken away. Andrew Reichman was never charged in this case. His lawyers maintained there was no evidence that he participated in the crime. 
prosecutors reluctantly agreed. The difference between McEnany and Reichman, aside from the fact that uh, I believe that McEnany was the principal, the forensic evidence was against uh, McEnany. We didn't have any forensic evidence against Reichman. Investigators say this was a classic example of barely visible evidence leading directly to a killer. The general principle of forensics is when you go somewhere, you do one of two things. You either leave evidence or you take evidence with you. It was easy for the jury to see something like that. Uh, juries like that. Uh, they, they can put the puzzle together. And we just provide them with the pieces and let them go with it wherever it goes. I'm thankful, yes, that there are experts in their field and they were able to find the evidence that they got.